All right, thank you, Dr. Davis, for asking me to participate in another one of these Derm Path Happy Hours, and welcome everybody to this week's Happy Hour. We are going to be talking about something that is probably, um, I like to think of it as being a little more fun, a little more straightforward, and that cysts or cystic structures. So uh, let's go ahead and get started, and we'll start with number one. And let me just kind of zoom in here. So let me get you oriented. Here is your regular epidermis. And you can see there are some sebaceous glands here. So you could start thinking about locations where you have sebaceous glands, something like the face, the back. And we have this nice big fat cyst. So one of the first things you wanna do when looking at a cyst is to look at the lining or the wall. So let's see here, what's going on with this one? We have a stratified squamous epithelium it is undergoing keratinization. So you see those keratinocytes sort of flattening out um, and becoming more and more pink, just like you would see in a regular epidermis. And then the granular layer is also present, which is very important as well. That can help you distinguish different kinds of cysts. So really it looks a lot like the epidermis. Within the cyst, you have this sort of loosely packed keratin and um, that will also help you kind of distinguish this. Is it loosely packed? Is it compactly? or is it tightly com compacted down? Uh, in this particular cyst, you also have these little whorls here, which doesn't always happen. I'm guessing the cyst is kind of old and looks like there are also some cholesterol clefts there, but again, not necessarily uh, something you would find in every epidermal inclusion cyst, which is what this is, or an infundibular cyst. Oftentimes it's gonna look more just like this loosely packed stuff. Um, but in this case, it has some extra features, but that's really it. So in a nutshell, you have a lining that resembles the epidermis. It has all of the layers here. It is stratified. It has a granular layer and then this loose keratin within. Easy peasy. So let's move on to two. I'm gonna orient you guys. Here's your epidermis. Again, you see some sebaceous glands. In this case, you see these large terminal hairs that are kind of situated deep in the dermis. So that might tell you that it's uh, located in the scalp. And I used to tell my residents when I used to teach to always use every clue possible to get you to an answer when you're looking at stuff on your boards. And I mentioned this the last time that I participated in happy hour as well. So in this case, it's probably scalp. So you could start thinking about what sort of cysts you see on the scalp and that might help you kind of get in the right direction. So again, let's look at the lining here. You can see that it is again, a stratified squamous epithelium. And in this case, you don't see it really flattening out. Actually, as you go inward, the keratinocytes are kind of enlarging. They're getting bulkier, taller. And then there's this abrupt transition between this epithelium and the keratin. And you don't see that, that granular layer like we saw at the last one. And the keratin itself is much more compact. It's very eosinophilic. And this is a pilar cyst or trichalimal cyst. And it is thought to kind of resemble the external root sheath of the isthmus. So that kind of tells us where this one comes from. You can often find some other features in these cysts like this. So this kind of chunky, dark purple stuff. So this is calcium. So these cysts oftentimes become calcified, particularly when they're old or traumatized. And then they can also have these cholesterol clefts as well. So you can see both of those features commonly in a pilar cyst. Okay, moving on to three, kind of in the same vein. We're gonna look at the lining here. It looks very similar to the last one. We see a stratified squamous epithelium. We see the keratinocytes getting bigger as they move inward. So kind of the same process that we saw in the pilar cyst, but in this case, it's like you have all these little tiny cystic structures within the cyst itself, within the mother cyst. And the buzzwords that we use for this is rolls and scrolls. So it's kind of rolling up and creating this scroll look. And it can also be calcified. And it can also have cholesterol clefts in it as well. So this is this is a pilar, uh, a pilar cyst, but it's proliferating pilar cyst. And as a dermatopathologist, you need to make sure that there isn't a squamous cell carcinoma starting to arise in this, and it's not transforming into squamous cell carcinoma. And in fact, there are some dermatopathologists that feel like these are a variant of squamous cell carcinoma. So that's what that looks like. It looks pretty benign to me. 
but oftentimes, you know, we want to make sure that clinicians know uh, to get these removed so that they don't have a chance to turn into anything else. Okay. So let's go straight to it. Let's look at the lining of this cyst. Stratified squamous. There is a granular cell layer here. There's kind of loose keratin, laminated keratin. So you might think that this is an epidermal inclusion cyst, which it is, but one thing that's different about this one is you have these areas, these like eosinophilic areas here, and they're composed of what's called ghost cells. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about ghost cells in the next entity as well. But you have these um, pink areas with what looks to be like the shadows of cells. So they're sometimes called shadow cells. And in this case, the cells have lost their nuclei and um, they were once upon a time matrical cells, but they turn into these ghost cells. So when you have a pattern with a regular looking epidermal inclusion cyst, but you also have these ghost cells, you start thinking about an epidermal inclusion cyst with pilomatrical uh, differentiation. And we see that sometimes in patients with gardeners. So we used to think it was pathognomonic path for gardeners, but it's not so much. It can actually be seen in other things as well. But if you were to see this on one of your patients, you definitely would want to get more into the history, family history, their history, to make sure that they don't have gardeners, because it can be pretty telling if they have these cysts. So let's move on to number five. All right, so this is one of my favorites and oftentimes I can tell what it is right away just by the shape. It can sometimes be encapsulated and it has different areas. You can see like there's different areas here. There's a little blue area and some pink and something else going on up here. So let's see what's going on. So here we have what are called matrical cells. So they look like the cells that you see in the matrix of the hair follicle. So they're blue and they have big nuclei. And as they are transforming into those ghost cells that we talked about with the last entity, you start to see the nuclei getting smaller and smaller, more pycnotic, until eventually there is no nucleus anymore and you have left over, you have those ghost cells. So in a newer pilometricoma, because this is a pilometricoma, in a newer pilometricoma, you may have more of the matrical differentiation and less of the ghost cells. And as it ages, you start seeing that turn more and more into ghost cells. Also, as it ages, you might start to see some calcification. So you'll see that kind of chunky um, purple stuff, like what we saw in the pilar cyst. And they can even sometimes ossify. So you might see bone in there as well. And I actually had a friend who asked me to remove some pilomatricomas on her forearm that had become irritated. And when I took them out, they were just packed full of bone. And she thought that was pretty gross, but of course I thought that was pretty cool. So you can see, um, I wouldn't say it's common to see bone in these, but you definitely can see bone in older lesions, particularly ones that have been traumatized like hers was. Okay, moving on to six. So in this one, let's go look at the lining. Stratified squamous epithelium, it's keratinizing. There is a granular cell layer. You can see it really nicely here. There's this loosely packed keratin. So again, you might be thinking that this is just a uh, epidermal inclusion cyst. It's just an EIC. But then you start to notice like these things in the wall. So here we have some sebaceous glands. You might notice some eccrine glands or apocrine glands. In this case, I mostly just see the sebaceous glands, which I think is the most common finding. But in this case, this is a dermoid cyst. So it has the features of an epidermal inclusion cyst, but then you also have the adnexal structures in the wall as well. And these are usually formed at the embryonic fusion lines. And the most common spot is on the lateral eyebrow here. And you'll see these in kiddos. So this is kind of similar, but different. So you need to differentiate these. You can see that this cyst is sort of collapsed on itself. So it's not big and round like the epidermal inclusion cyst. 
And there's some extra stuff going on here. So let's look at what is happening. We have squamous epithelium again. And then along the squamous epithelium, you have this, what's called an eosinophilic cuticle. Uh, sometimes referred to as like a sharp tooth cuticle because it can sometimes look like sharp teeth and kind of undulate. And it's, it's pink, hence the eosinophilic. And so that is really telling for a steatocystoma. Now, let's say you, you're like, oh, I think that's what's going on, but I'm not entirely sure. I mean, the presence of these sebaceous glands in the wall are very telling. And then within it, you actually have this sort of oily looking substance with these little vellus hairs. So all of these little brown things are hair shafts, but they're vellus hairs, so they're teeny tiny. And that's gonna come up again here in just a minute. But the steatocystomas oftentimes will have some vellus hairs within, within the sac. So that's a steatocystoma. And what is going on with this? So let's kind of dive in a little bit squamous epithelium, no granular layer. Well, there kind of is a granular layer, but you have this, this compacted keratin. So this probably is um, a pilar cyst, but within the wall, you see all of this. So I said no granular layer. There's not like a true granular layer. What you have here is just a regular keratohyaline granules. Um, you can even in some spots see some vacuolated keratinocytes that sort of look like coilocytes. So these are the sorts of changes that we see in warts. And in this case, this is a Veruca cyst. And so it's basically just a cyst that has HPV in the wall. So you start to see these viral changes like what you would see in a wart. Very nice. Not much else to it. You see some cholesterol clefts here. is just form body reaction to the, the cyst rupturing, which can happen. In this particular one, so this is number nine, uh, location is going to be very telling. So if you look at the dermis here, you see the collagen is very delicate and you have all these smooth muscle bundles. And after a while, you just start to recognize um, what the dermis looks like in different locations. And in this case, it looks like genital skin. So again, use your location as a clue. If we look at the lining, we have pseudostratified columnar epithelium, and then you have all this debris within the cyst sac. So those features are all good for a median raphe cyst, which are often found on the penis. So that hints the genital skin and all of the smooth muscle. And sometimes these can be a bit more inflamed, but all of this stuff is telling. Not much more to it than that. Moving on to number 10, which is one of my favorites. See this cute little cyst here. So stratified squamous epithelium, it is keratinizing. There is the semblance of like a little um, granular layer there, although it's kind of puny. But within the cyst itself, you again have all of these little brown structures and those are all vellus hairs. So in this case, this is an erupted vellus hair cyst. These are often found uh, on the central chest and they kind of show up as these like reddish brown bumps um, oftentimes, you know, I, the, the patients that I see that have these are kids, their parents are bringing them in because they're concerned about what it is. They think it's acne or they think they're just like regular EICs. And then, uh, you know, you have to explain that they're vellus hair cysts. Kind of cool once you recognize them clinically and very easy to recognize histologically as well. So not much more to say about that. Moving right along, we are moving quickly. All right, so let's see what's happening here. And this is the action right there, but let's look at the lining first. So in this case, we have um, pseudostratified columnar cells again, 
but it is ciliated. So this is consistent with respiratory epithelium. And the key to what's going on here is actually these little guys over here. So you have all these thyroid follicles. So in this case, this is a thyro thyroglossal duct cyst. And these occur as um, the duct is moving up the body, up the chest, and when the embryo is, is forming. And sometimes you can get some tissue that's caught along the way and it forms these thyroglossal duct cysts. They're midline, usually presenting in kiddos. But the key is going to be all of these follicles here. And just remember that it often is respiratory epithelium. So ciliated and then the pseudo pseudo stratified columnar epithelium. Sorry about that, guys. All right, last but not least. Let's see what's going on here. Very similar to the last thing that we saw. Again, ciliated, pseudostratified columnar epithelium. I said it that time. In this case, you start to see these lighter, big cells in the epithelium. Those are goblet cells. And you may, um, in some of these cysts, you may find concentric smooth muscle around the whole thing. It's not as obvious in this one, maybe a bit. Yeah, you can see that there. So this is a bronchogenic cyst. I think it's just a little bit pale, but this is a bronchogenic cyst. Um, sometimes it's hard to distinguish these from, say, the thyroglossal duct cysts, but these aren't going to have those thyroid follicles like what you saw. And the smooth muscle kind of gives it away. They can also be confused with branchial cleft cysts, but the branchial cleft cysts are going to have lymphoid follicles in the wall, whereas these might, but generally they don't. So if you are on your board exam trying to figure out which one this is, because it's, you know, this respiratory epithelium and there's three other things have respiratory epithelium and you aren't sure what it is, just look for the smooth muscle. Yeah, so you can see it there. The smooth muscle, concentric around the wall of the cyst. Um, and, you know, look for the absence of things like the thyroid follicles and the lymphoid follicles that you see in the branchial cleft cysts. Well, this is probably a short one for you guys. Um, cysts, again, are pretty straightforward. So you just look at the lining, you know, look to see where the location is, try to figure out which kind of cyst it is that you're looking at. Clinically, you know, know where they came from, um, know what they could turn into, know which ones are concerning, which ones aren't. Um, we remove a ton of cysts every single day. I, as a dermatologist, remove a ton of cysts every single day. So you're gonna see a lot of that as you get into practice. Um, there are the rarer ones like the bronchogenic thyroglossal duct, but in terms of epidermal inclusion cysts and pilar cysts, you know, dime a dozen in practice. So if you guys have any questions, please, please, please feel free to send it to us. Someone will definitely answer you. Um, so you can go ahead and send the question through chat and then we will get back with you with the answer or uh, Dr. Davis might be around to answer this for you as well. Um, you can always contact me if you have a question for me. You can get a hold of Sages and ask, just ask for my contact information and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you guys have. So hopefully you enjoyed happy hour today. Like I said, short and sweet. Um, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks so much for tuning in. Bye-bye, guys.